Yeah, I wanted to ask you, man, how did you approach those less familiar traditions? Because until comparatively recently, the West has taken rather a condescending attitude to them, and that's, that's clearly changing now. It, it, I think it's changing partly because of work that's being done on the cognition of music. I think people have who are interested in this have realised that looking at non-Western systems of music is, for one thing, it's a very good way of testing people's responses in a way that, that, that isn't too conditioned by what they've heard already, you know, by either using non-Western music on Western subjects or vice versa. And also p people have become increasingly interested in, in the question of whether there are universalities in music, whether they're universals, whether there are things that are common to all cultures, because if there are, then you can at least start to wonder about whether this is telling you something about the, the basic cognitive processes that we all have in, in the human brain, rather than things that have been put there by culture, if you like. So... You know that stimulates interest in non-Western music. Now, I should also say that actually there is now quite a long-standing tradition of certainly of of fifty, sixty, seventy years or so of uh, people who have explored the discipline called ethnomusicology, which looks. It's a funny term because traditionally it's it's tended to to everything that that is non-Western has tended to fall within the remit of ethnomusicology. And somehow Western music was outside of that. I think now there's a more enlightened view that regards all music as you know part of ethnomusicology. And one aspect of that is is how people use music in their everyday lives. So you know a lot of the studies on certainly on music theory but but also the early studies in music cognition tended to draw on western classical music that was you know really the only sort of music that was tested and there are some good reasons why that could be so but actually that's you know testing for one thing it's testing a small part of the musical universe but also it's uh, it, it's making tests using a kind of music that actually isn't you know the majority uh, music in even in western culture so now increasingly people are interested in look sort of looking at how within the west we use music from an ethnomusicological uh, an anthropological perspective what we do with music mm. You mentioned music in everyday life, and I think one of the messages of the book is that we are all musical, and even those people who claim they are tone deaf, and you say that a surprisingly high percentage of people claim to be tone deaf, and in fact only a, a, a relatively small fraction of those are in fact what, what could strictly be called tone deaf. That's that's right. People, it's an easy sort of thing that people, you know, often trip off if they feel unconfident about music. They They, they just... To, to tell you that they're tone deaf. I think often that actually means that people are, um, in the West are embarrassed about their their singing voice. It's very hard to get people to to, to sing, and. I really wanted to challenge that idea because I, what I wanted to, to, to show was that simply hearing music as music, you know, if you're just listening to a piece of nondescript music on the radio, the fact that you can nevertheless hear it as music and, uh, is, is, is the result of an incredible array of cognitive faculties that you're bringing to bear unconsciously obviously unconsciously we don't know that we're doing it but it, it, it brings those to bear on what is a really complex acoustic signal and turns it into something that's coherent and even meaningful to us and emotive to us so in that sense pretty much everyone has a highly developed sense of musicality and i think it's I think it's valuable for us to recognise that that's the case, that actually, you know, listening to music, although it's something that we, we a, a skill that we acquire unconsciously and acquire at a surprisingly early age on the whole, nevertheless, it's an impressive feat. And it's one that itself carries a strong element of, of musicality. So... I wanted to challenge that partly because, you know, we have this sort of slightly strange attitude that there's a small proportion of the population who are the musicians and the musical ones and the rest of us are just somehow consumers. But I also wanted to, to challenge it because I think there are ramifications for how we think about music in education. And I really wanted to make a plea for music being seen as 
a central part of education and not just something that you do if you have the time. There are all sorts of reasons why you can argue for that. And you know, one is utilitarian, that it seems clear that music does increase. And I'm not talking about listening to Mozart as a baby. I'm talking generally about using music that it does in, it does enhance intelligence. But you know, the, the arguments shouldn't be simply about utilitarian, utilitarian principles like that. I think that that music clearly also is a social experience, it's a socialising experience, and that it gives people access to a whole sort of realm of human creativity and emotion that it's it, that it's. I think everyone ought to be uh, be encouraged to to discover. Mm. Let me ask you a sort of big question. How do you hope that readers of the book will have their understanding or their pleasure of music enhanced, either as listeners or as, as players? What, what, what do you think particularly the, the windows you're opening for them might be? I, I'd hope that it might encourage people to listen outside of their comfort zone I suppose I mean it certainly encouraged me to do that it encouraged me to go and find out about some music that I hadn't heard before and to look for you know even if it sounded quite strange to begin with to to search within it for things that for ha for footholds really I found that that was the case for and I'm still working on it for uh, for Javanese gamelan for example uh, which you know is it, it, it it's quite sort of fascinating when you first hear it but I can also imagine that it would be quite intimidating because it sounds very different quite alien really for for a western ear I would hope that if you understand a little bit about not just the or not necessarily at all about the theory of what's going on there but about the kinds of cognitive pathways that it's making use of then that it that does become a window through which you can start to to explore it and that's particularly true for some contemporary classical music western classical music for a lot of people um i mean i say contemporary loosely often that sort of tends to mean anything sort of post schoenberg that you know isn't vaughan williams <laughs> And I think for a lot of people, it, that, that is something that's very difficult to, to find a way into. Sometimes, and I talk about this in the book, sometimes there are good reasons for that. And I think sometimes uh, some of the experiments that have been done in contemporary classical music have actually not just ignored, but, but almost systematically undermined some of the cognitive uh, mechanisms that we need in order to, to make sense of music. And then you really do have a problem. It's It's a sort of arid argument whether you then want to call what comes out music or not but I think it's understandable that people would find it difficult to to, to to grab hold of but I think more often it's simply a case of finding a new listening strategy and that's sort of what I want to encourage people at least to think about to show that actually because we have all these different cognitive tools that can be brought to bear you know we can we, we don't have to use the familiar ones that we always use there may well be others there may well be other ways of making sense of the music that you know that we have the tools uh, to bring to bear if we if we choose to do that maybe Phil I can ask you in conclusion apart from the Javanese gamelan any other great discoveries you made and any blind spots that you're willing to own up to in your own, in your own listening? <laughs> yes, both. Um, one of the discoveries, I'd listened on and off to music of uh, Georgi Ligeti and, uh, you know, had never sort of applied my ear properly to it. And I think having listened to more of it through um, uh, writing this book, I just think he's a genius. I think he's one of the most extraordinary explorers of sound that we've had in the 20th century and he's done that in so many different ways one area that i uh, one big area and it's going to be it's probably will sound a bit horrifying that i will confess to still struggling with is opera but i think that as a result of looking into this book i think i have perhaps an understanding of why that might be so because i think one of the difficulties i i've often had with opera is that it doesn't it it seems a very a very artificial way of using the human voice and actually that that that's literally true that's strictly true it is artificial um the the expressive devices that are used in opera are often quite different from the ones that we generally tend to to use in the spoken word 
And also there are aspects of, because opera arose out of an attempt to try to render, paradoxically perhaps from what I've just said, to try to render human speech in musical form, now being more aware of the distinctions between language and music, I mean there are similarities but there are clear differences as well, it makes me think that that may be, you may be on a hiding to nothing if you're really trying to, to do that. That, that. Or at least, let's say, it's going to result in a compromise to the music if you're trying to make it too language-like in the way that it sounds. 